Good morning, church. Good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be pulling those out and uh, turning to John chapter 10. It's on page 759 in that pew Bible in front of you. Uh, hard to beat a song with a good alto lead to lead into uh, today's message. And I will have to say uh, that, Kevin, that uh, granddaddy looks good on you. And so congratulations to you and Kevin, as, uh, you and Glenn, as you welcome your grandson this week. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, well, today I uh, wanted to jump in. I'm, I'm thankful for the call that we've had to begin submitting uh, you know, names to our shepherds uh, about adding additional shepherds. And I want to encourage us to uh, to pray about that, and as I reflected on Acts chapter 14, 23, where, where we read that, that Paul and, and Barnabas, they, they appointed elders with prayer and fasting. And so uh, before we uh, jump to submitting anything, I hope that we will submit to, uh, to that call to pray about what God is doing in us and among us. I'm really thankful for our shepherds and thankful for uh, the, the, the fact that they walk alongside me and my family and you as well. And uh, last week, uh, I want to say thank you to those who participated in our uh, church health assessment survey. And it was just encouraging to me, uh, you know, about 100 or so of us gathered in the gym just to kind of see the results of that and to see how uh, our, our shepherds kind of view of things and then our congregation's view of things, the way that they uh, align so closely, that was a blessing to me to see that. Uh, also, there's, as any church, there's things for us to work on. And uh, we acknowledge those things as well. And uh, as our consultant uh, shared with us last week, you know, those are not changes that are gonna be able to happen overnight, uh, maybe not even the next two months. But as we prayerfully move forward, I want to encourage you to continue to uh, just to, to be in prayer about what God is doing here among our faith family. And uh, as we think about that today, my conviction is as a church family, it's important for us to reflect on uh, some passages and some things in the biblical text uh, as, we, as we think about adding additional leaders. And I believe that there's, there's biblical principles that surround this concept of, of shepherding uh, for us to reflect on. And I have to admit, growing up, I, I heard sermons on uh, elders or shepherds, and uh, quite frankly, I had trouble during those sermons because I had trouble like, seeing like, where I fit into those. Like, where was my place in that? You know, elder was shepherd was kind of way down the road, and, and so I, I had uh, trouble with those. And sometimes, quite honestly, I just tuned out. Um, I know none of you would do that to one of my sermons, but I, I did that when I was growing up to some uh, of the sermons I heard. And, uh, but I'm convinced that there's some biblical principles today that we're going to look at that will meet you wherever you are in your life. It doesn't matter if you're a single adult. It doesn't matter if you're a, a senior adult. It doesn't matter if you're married. It doesn't matter if uh, whatever stage of, of life that you find yourself in, that there are some some principles that we find that will be applicable to you today, wherever you are in your journey. And so I'm, I'm convinced of that as, as, we, as we jump in. And I believe today's message has important implications for each of us. Uh, I want to put a, a video up on the screen. A few months ago, uh, Lainey and I got to go and visit some relatives up in Paducah, Kentucky. And one of our relatives uh, actually owns a bunch of sheep. And so I just pulled out my, my device and started recording. And you can see uh, these sheep here. And you saw that um, Lainey's cousin just went and opened the gate for these sheep. And what do the sheep do? Absolutely nothing. They just, they just stand there. I don't know how many of you have been around sheep before. Um, but it's interesting to think about how uh, the Bible uh, talks about this metaphor over and over again. Uh, shepherd and, and sheep. And it, matter of fact, in the Old and New Testament, both, uh, you'll see uh, this metaphor played out time and time again that the people of God are referred to as sheep. In his book, They Smell Like Sheep, Lynn Anderson says that if we drop the shepherd and the flock idea, that we would have to rip about 500 pages out of our Bible if we just got rid of that whole metaphor and concept. And so now we might think, as we think about being referred to as, as sheep, we might think that, oh, that's a lovely metaphor, you know, fluffy, cute, sheep. Um, 
But the reality is, is that sheep is not the, the most uh, admirable metaphor that we could be referred to as. Uh, the fact of the matter is that sheep are not very flattering when you think about it. For one, as you could tell in the video, sheep are not uh, the sharpest animals in the world. You know, the, sh the gates open, come on, we're just going, you know, they're, they're singing a song, if you say go, we will wait. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, it's not if, we, if you say go, we'll go. I mean, that, sheep have, have need kind of this, this prompting a lot of times. When you stop and think about sheep, uh, have you ever seen a, a, a trained sheep in a circus? Anybody? Anybody seen a trained sheep in a circus? I mean, the closest thing that I could find uh, to a, a sheep doing something trained or doing a trick uh, was this picture right here of a, of a sheep catching a Frisbee. I mean, that's the, that's the closest thing I could find. You know, I mean, sheep aren't trained. They're, they're, not, they're not fancy. They're not, they don't, you know, give off these, oh, man, that's a really smart animal. Uh, sheep are not very bright. They can't run fast. They're basically defenseless against predators. I mean, you ever been in somebody's yard before and you, you ever seen a sign that says, hey, beware of guard sheep? I mean, you don't see that sign, right? No, sheep have to be guarded, right? Why do they have to be guarded? Because they're so de defenseless. And a sheep's survival often depends on its proximity to the shepherd. And it can't just be any shepherd. It has to be a good shepherd. And so in John chapter 10, Jesus claims just this. He says that I am, verse 11, the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. That's what Jesus says. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is one of seven of Jesus's I am statements in the Gospel of John. He'll say things like, I am the light. I am I'm the bread of life. I, I'm the gate. And he gets to, to this part in John's Gospel, and he is trying to communicate something to us and to the, the people of that day. He says, I am the good shepherd. But to say that I am the good shepherd implies that there are some bad ones, right? Why would Jesus say, I am the good shepherd, if there weren't any bad ones? So we need to understand kind of the context of what Jesus is talking about. And in order to do that, we have to back up to John chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles and you want to flip back a page to John chapter 9, do you remember what happened in John chapter 9? In John chapter 9, there's this man who is born blind. It's the only occurrence in the Gospels of a man being born blind and then being healed by Jesus. Now, there were other blind people healed by Jesus, but this is the only one that we, we know in Scripture that was born blind. So this man's, this man's born blind, and then he's healed by Jesus. And so folks, as you can imagine, around him kind of get uh, excited, and people start talking, and everybody is, is kind of like, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing, except for the religious leaders of the day except for the Pharisees. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they asked him, how can you explain this? And, and, and the man that was born blind that's now able to see says, I, I don't know. This, this man, Jesus, must obviously be a prophet. And, and of course, the Pharisees, they didn't want to hear that about Jesus, just how people don't want to hear things about Jesus today. So they went to his parents, the Pharisees did, and they asked his parents to come in. Because they thought, well, maybe, maybe this man wasn't really blind at birth. So they brought the parents in, and, and they had the, the parents come into the synagogue. And they, they asked you know, the parents, you know, was, what, basically, was he, was he blind at, at birth? And they're very skittish to respond. They, they don't want to say anything that's going to incriminate them in any way. The reason they don't is because that if, if you were to 
support Jesus back in that time in, in any way that you could be kicked out of the synagogue. And we hear that today. We hear about like being kicked out of, of the, the church or something. And, and it, it's, it's bad, but it doesn't, it doesn't really affect us the same way because, you know, you, you could go down the road to another church. But in this day and age, it was completely different. You, when you were kicked out of the synagogue, you basically became like a social leper. I mean, this was your, your whole social life revolved around this connection, these relationships with people. And so when you were kicked out of synagogue, that was, that was more than just, oh, I'm, I'll run down to another synagogue. And so all they would say, the parents, is that we're not taking any stances. <laughs> all we can tell you is that, yes, he was, he was blind when he was born, but we're not taking any other stances. He's of age. They point it to their son. They're kind of throwing him under. The, He's of age. Why don't you just ask him? Ask him uh, what, what you want to know. And so they go back to this man again. Let's pick up in verse 24 in chapter 9. You can read with me along on the screen. John 9, 24. Second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know is that I was blind, but now I see. Church... It is hard to argue with a changed life. It's hard to argue with a changed life. I, rem I remember the, the two uh, college students who went to go hear the atheist on campus to, to, who was going to debunk Christianity. And he, had very, he was very skilled orator, and he, he basically just went one thing after another trying to debunk Christianity. The two college students walk out. One of them looks to the other one and said, man, he, he really just put Christianity in his place, didn't he? And the other college student said, well, no, not really. He didn't explain my mom's life. And until somebody can explain her life to me, her changed life, I'm going to stick with her God. And, and this is, this is the, the, the essence of kind of what is happening here. You can't argue with a changed life. Verse 26, and they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he, how did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> but they love to hear that question. Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Then he answered. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God has not listened to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Have you ever heard of a shepherd throwing a sheep out? So Jesus finds this man. And he, he leads him to faith. And this man worships Jesus. You can read that in the text. And then in verse 39, John 9, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. So what's the context here? I want you to think about keeping John 10 and John 9 in your mind at the same time. The context, what's going on? What's the context? The context is this, that Jesus has just called the leaders of the people blind leaders. That these are bogus shepherds. And the problem for God's people has not been the presence of wolves. The problem for God's people has always been the absence of shepherds. If you have good shepherds, the wolves aren't a problem. And so John 10, look at verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And here's the preeminent qualification for shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. There's always people who are willing to lead. But there's very few that are willing to lay down their lives. 
So a lot of times when we talk about shepherds or overseers or elders or bishops or presbyters, all biblical terms, pastors, we typically hear 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1. An overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his spouse, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. He must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And let me tell you, church, all of those are very important qualities, and I would encourage you to spend some time looking at 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 this week to meditate and reflect on those qualities of a leader, of a shepherd. But I find it curious that the only book of the New Testament that is specifically addressed to leaders we find in the book of Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to the holy saints in the church of Philippi. So he's, he's writing to the whole church, but then he also says this little phrase, the only place we find it, with the overseers and the diakonos. The, the, the overseers, the, the, the shepherds, the, the elders, and, and with the, the diakonos, the ministry team leaders, the, the, the deacons, the, the, the servants of the congregation. So he's writing to everybody, but he specifically is writing also to the leaders as well. And he points them out. And I think this is so curious to me because of what's going on in, in the day. Social historian, historian uh, Joseph Hellerman, he, he writes this, you'll see it on the screen, is that Christians in Philippi, were to pattern their lives not after the values of Rome, but after a Jewish Messiah who willingly exchanged his immeasurably exalted status for the shame of a crucified slave, all for the benefit of rebellious human beings whom he had created. Paul intended the example of Jesus to indelibly mark the ways in which power and authority were used in the Christian community at Philippi. In other words, Rome had a leadership model which emphasized and exerted power. It's called cursus honorum, the sequential order of public offices. And so there was a rank, and Philippi was kind of like this, this mini Rome of sorts, an honor-shame culture, that, that an individual's behavior was judged based on what brought honor or shame to the social group. And so the hierarchy was, was very much important in that day. We see this in Acts chapter 16. You can go and look at it later. The birth, the genesis, the beginning of the Philippian church, we read about in Acts chapter 16. And how did the Philippian church begin? It began with a rich lady named Lydia, a slave girl, and a Philippian jailer. Where else in the world would those three people be doing life together? And this is how, this is how the church begins, the Philippian church begins. And what's, what's interesting, when we talk about this honor-shame culture, it was very much evident, particularly in the Philippian jailer, because the Philippian jailer uh, is, is sitting there one night, he's, he's watching uh, Paul and Silas, and, and all of a sudden this earthquake comes, the, the prison doors fly open, and, and, and the Philippian jailer wakes up and, and doesn't see the prisoners, thinks they're gone, so, so he pulls his sword out not to go look for the prisoners. The Philippian jailer pull, pulls the sword out to put it on himself. Why? Honor-shame. Honor, shame, culture. That if, if, if he did not do his duty, if he did not uh, keep these prisoners where they were supposed to be, Paul and Silas where they were supposed to be, then basically his life wasn't worth living anymore. He knew he'd be put to death, so he might as well just put himself to death. And right before he, he puts the sword into himself, Paul yells out, hey, hey, we're, we're all here. We're all here. It's, it's okay. And what does the Philippian jailer do? He falls at his feet, falls at the feet of Paul and Silas, and what does he say? <laughs> he says, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> what must I do to be saved? And Paul tells him to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the Philippian jailer and his whole household were baptized into Christ. Amazing story, but, but a depiction of what's going on in Philippi, this, this honor-shame culture and how this, this hierarchy is, is so prevalent in that day. 
the leadership model was cursus honorum. It's climbing the ladder at its finest. And this idea of positional authority had begun making its way into the church. And this can even happen today. That we can view the church leadership as ranks. Go from a member a, to a small group leader to a, a, a ministry team leader to a staff member to an to a, a elder shepherd. And we, we can begin even thinking in those terms when it comes to leadership. Archaeologists have found that several second century tombstones of local Christians presumably boasting about the offices that they had held in the church during their lifetime. It's written on their tombstones. And Paul comes along in the letter to the Philippians and he turns cursus honorum completely upside down. He flips it on its head. I mean, you talk about the upside down. I mean, there's, there's no stranger thing than, than this, right? That, that he has completely flipped the, the political order of the day on its head. How does he do that? What does he say in Philippians chapter 2? Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But can rather in humility value others above yourselves. We have Philippians 3 on the screen. Let's take that off the screen. Let's listen to Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but to each of you the interest of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Get this, church. The Holy Spirit intends Paul's teaching to transform our understanding of leadership in our churches today, that it's a self-emptying vision. That the world teaches us to look for those who are climbing the ladder. The world teaches us to look for those who are, who are in places of honor. And Paul reminds us that in God's economy, we look not to our own interests. As shepherds, as ministers, as the church of Jesus Christ, our call is to have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, to walk as he walked, to live as he lived. And you want to know who to raise up as leaders? Then look for those among us who are lowering themselves to serve. Look for those among us who are living this crucified life. Paul would say in Galatians, I've been, been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in, in this flesh, I live by faith. I live by faith in the Son of God who, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how I live. And so one of the guys in Scripture that gives me the most hope is a guy named Peter. <laughs> Peter always seemed to be sticking his foot in his mouth. Sometimes he would just take both feet and just stick them right in his mouth. Anybody else been there? Anybody else can identify with that? I've done that before. And so when I, when I hear about Peter, I, I'm, I'm encouraged. Because I'm like, hey, this dude's kind of like me <laughs> in a lot of ways. And Peter, the guy that would would get his feet washed by Jesus and say, hey, don't, don't just wash my feet. Don't just stop there. Wash my whole body. P Peter, the, the guy that would just tell Jesus, you know, you know everybody else, they may, they may deny you, but not me, not me, not me. And then what happens? He's asked, you know, do you know Jesus? No. Do you know Jesus? N no. Do you know Jesus? No. cock a doodle do. The rooster crows. He denied his friend three times. But one of the most beautiful pictures in Scripture is in John 21, where Jesus has died. He's been resurrected. He comes back. He sits down with Peter. 
by a campfire. And he asked him three questions. Do you love me? Lord, you know that I, do you love me? Do you love me? Yes. So Henry Nouwen says this quote. Henry Nouwen talks about this idea of power. He said, what makes the temptation of power so seemingly irresistible? Maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God. Easier to control people than to love people. Easier to own life than to love life. And Jesus asked, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Let's pray this morning. Father, we're thankful for the example that we see in your son. We're grateful that as we reflect on uh, that very question, I pray that uh, we'll just take a moment right here, a moment of silence to just sit with Jesus looking at us face to face and asking us the question, do you love me? Let's reflect on that for a moment. Father, we're thankful that Jesus modeled what it meant to be the good shepherd. And as we think about our lives, and when we go into our lives uh, this week, as we go into our places of work, as we go into our homes, as we go into our schools, as we go into our neighborhoods and our communities, Father, may we be a people who are looking not, not only to our own interest, but to the interest of others. Father, may we be a people who live a life, the life that we see in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, thank you for this teaching today. I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be able to, to serve and teach this church, and I, I pray that we will continue to be a people that seek after your heart, that will know you by, by the way that your love compels us and is in us. And Father, may we set our purpose on seeking first your kingdom, to loving you above anything else, that you're not a list of one of 10, you're a list of, of one on, of one. And so may we just place our attention and, and our gaze on you this week. And for those of us who are, are trying to find our calling, may we, may we just remember that if we're focusing on you and, and, and loving you first and everything that we do, that our calling will find us. God, we love you. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be standing, church. We're going to sing this song. There will be a shepherd down front, a shepherding couple back here in this room right here. Uh, if you have a need this morning or if today is the day that you want to name Jesus as Lord and be baptized in Him, we'd love to celebrate that with you. Come as we sing this song. I am a sheep and the Lord is my shepherd.
So I want to introduce you to a friend of mine that I've known for 40 years. He's a brother of ours. His name is Larry Ramsey. I knew him when we were living in Tupelo, Mississippi when I was in high school. And um, I know his mom and dad. And I know his life. He knows mine. And Larry came and he was talking to us and he said he hasn't lived the life that he knows he's supposed to. He told us that he needed a heart procedure physically. And we talked this morning about how that God's working a heart procedure on him now. He said he doesn't treat his employees like he knows he ought to. He hadn't been the example to his family. But what I do know about Larry is that Larry sees what God wants to do in his life. And he has a heart to come back to that. And so for that, we're grateful. And so, Larry, I want you to stand up here with me, brother. I want you to look at your brothers and sisters. And I want you all to look at Larry. And... Uh, I want us to join together now because Larry not only has decided to, to align himself again with what God calls him to, but he wants to make it known that he wants to do that here at this church. And as a body, we want to welcome him and forgive him and pray that God uh, continues to draw him near. Pray with me. Father, I love this man. Thank you for allowing our lives to be intertwined over the years. Father, Larry confesses that his life has not always looked the way that uh, he thinks it ought to look and he knows that it's not looked the way that he wants to please you and so father i pray forgiveness for larry's sins in his life thank you for the heart that you've given him that he's willing to confess those things thank you father for the willingness for him to see that he desires to serve alongside brothers and sisters who love him who want to forgive him and who want to serve in a bold new way in your kingdom. I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to close with this song. Just stand up where you are, and we're going to close out with this, and then we'll be dismissed. He's coming over the clouds.